Today's episode is brought to you by Instructional Design Institute. If you're looking to learn more about the instructional design field and how to make your courses even better, this is the resource for you. Within the Institute, there are courses designed to teach you new skills right away, along with support from a community to nerd out with. You also receive coaching from me on anything instructional design related. You can learn more by Googling Instructional Design Institute or go to drlukehobson.com. Sign up today for your free trial. And now to the show. Hey folks, and welcome on in to your favorite learning nerd podcast. My name is Dr. Luke Hobson, and I'm here to help you with all things instructional design and online learning related. My purpose is to help you make the online learning experience incredible for you and for your students. You can learn more about myself and the podcast, the blog, YouTube channel, and Instructional Design Institute over at drlukehobson.com. This is the second part of a series all about instructional design degrees. Last episode, Tim Slade gave us great insight into how to be a successful instructional designer without a degree. Now we're going to be talking about the opposite. We're going to be talking about the other perspective. Today's episode covers the benefits of instructional design degrees and their value. To dive on in deep into this conversation, I'm joined by Dr. Carl Kopp from Bloomsburg University. We explore topics like researching an institution's curriculum, the differences between certs and degrees, staying up to date on instructional design trends, what warning signs to look for in a degree program and how to capitalize on the benefits of going back to school. You are going to love this episode, so I won't take up any more time. Here is the one and only Dr. Carl Kopp. Carl, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks, Luke. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I am so excited that you are here. And for those folks at home who somehow don't know who you are, even though if you just Google your name, like 7,000 pages pop up of all your accomplishments and what you're currently doing. But for the folks at home who somehow don't know who you are, can you please just introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit more about you and what it is that you do. Sure. So uh, my name is Carl Kopp. I'm a professor of instructional technology at Bloomsburg University in Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania. And I've been doing that since 1997. And uh, I always say to people, that's my day job. And then I also, uh, a number of years ago, got really interested in gamification. So I've written a number of books on gamification, game-based learning, and things like that. And then got interested in 3D virtual worlds, uh, some books on that, and got interested in micro learning and have done some, uh, some people maybe have seen me on LinkedIn learning, done some LinkedIn learning courses there. So uh, really been uh, interested in the field of instructional design and technology for, for a long while now and have been, uh, you know, when you're old, a lot of stuff just piles up. So that's why there's so many things on the internet, <laughs> just because of, you know, sheer uh, length of life. <laughs> oh, the thing is that like whenever I, because I follow you, of course, on all these different channels, and I'm going to put all the links in the show notes so folks can follow you as well. But then I would go and I would watch one of your courses on LinkedIn Learning, because that's where I first actually heard about you was over there. And then as I'm following along, all of a sudden you're like, hey, here's a new uh-huh. book on micro learning. But then the next day, you're like, and here's my new video on gamification. I was like, how is he doing this? Like, what, what is he doing? <laughs> I need to understand your project planning methods because it, it's just right. nuts how much you're doing. And, and not only that, you go so deep into these topics. It's not like it's surface level. You are really hitting home with everything. Yeah, I, I get really fascinated by a subject and, and just kind of dive deep into it. I, I tell everybody between two and three every morning, I'm totally open. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but, um, I just get really fascinated by the subjects. That's how gamification I was, I was trying to find a word or a methodology to express like using parts of games, but not whole games. And for, for a lot of t- years, I didn't have a word. And then I came across this word gamification. I'm like, okay, let's take a deep dive into gamification. So that was that project. And then, um, I, I had read a blog. Somebody said that they had invented gamification and they hadn't. And I did some research there and that got me interested in the unofficial, unauthorized history of learning games. And then with gamification, a lot of people were putting out stuff using micro learning, but the micro learning wasn't that good. So I'm like, okay, now I need to dive into micro learning. So it's just kind of like, um, 
It's like my wife is redecorating our house, and it's like you change the curtains, then you have to paint the wall. If you paint the wall, then you have to change the rug. If you change the rug, then you have to get a new table. And so that's kind of how I approach instructional design. But my my main focus is um, as a graduate professor at Bloomsburg University, uh, teaching grad students the design, development, and implementation of uh, online learning and learning design. And that's really kind of uh, my passion. I've been doing that since uh, 1997. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. And exactly why you were on the show today, because I was trying to think of who to talk to about should I go back to school for an instructional design degree in 2021? And I'm like, yeah, well, Carl's the person. He is the guy. And luckily, <laughs> we had a mutual connection. Shout out to you, Peter Shea, for introducing us. So this is all because of him. So you got to give a Peter. shout out to Exactly. Got to give a shout out to that man who somehow knows everyone in the instructional design field. It is an absolute uh, mystery, but it's just so cool. So it's not a surprise to hear that more folks right now are thinking about instructional design now, of course, more than ever. But you somehow had enough insight to actually pursue a doctorate instructional design way before any of this actually came about. What made you want to pursue a degree in this field back in the 90s? Is I think yeah. When you went to Late, yeah. I started in the early 90s, actually. Yeah. So it actually started when I graduated from college. So I, I graduated from college in 1989. And so, um, and yes, there was electricity. So <laughs> when I graduated uh, back then, um, I wanted to find a job. And I, I had a teaching certificate. I had a degree in English. And I had almost a minor in psychology. I didn't have a minor because I did not want to cut the heads off of rats. So I'm like, you know, that's where I'm kind of going to draw the line right there. So a couple of classes, it was called um, Rat Lab, and you would have to – and I'm like, no, I'm not doing that. So anyway, so I had this weird combination of degrees, and I was trying to find something. And it turns out there was a company near where I lived called Applied Science Associates who did instructional technology. But I didn't know it at the time. I had no idea. They did a lot of government work. But when I was in sixth grade – I did a video called Willy Whistle for this organization, Applied Science. So when I graduated from high school, or I mean college, people said, yeah, Applied Science does something with English or writing or what, you know, talk to them. So I go up there and I said, well, uh, I'd like to um, reapply for a job here. And they're like, reapply? What do you mean? You're like just out of college. I said, well, when I was in sixth grade, I did the Willy Whistle videotapes and it was an instructional video on how to cross the street. And it was um, taught uh, – this woman kind of directed it, and it was like um, we were the kids who would look both ways or not look both ways and get yelled at, and, and it was for kids. So I'm like, oh, I want to do instructional. And so they had us do a little test, and I, I guess I passed. And then I got there, and I, I worked there for like four weeks, and finally I'm like, what is this field even called? Like it's really cool, but what's it called? And they're called – oh, it's called instructional technology. And they explained to me that the technology wasn't necessarily the tools, but a methodology that was systematic for designing instruction. And they had a, a government division and they had a corporate division. At the meantime, I was going back to get my degree in counseling because I thought, oh, uh, I would. So this is a weird idea. I thought I would counsel kids into how to get into like Harvard or whatever as a, as a guidance counselor. The flaw in that plan was. I didn't go to Harvard or any of those places. So why would anyone listen to me about going to those colleges? Sure. I don't yeah. know what I was thinking. That was a bad plan. But um, but uh, as I was going through, I said uh, a lot of people got their degree at the University of Pittsburgh. And so I switched from counseling to this thing called instructional technology. And it literally changed my life. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is the coolest thing ever. I can apply what I know about teaching I can apply what I know about psychology and what I know about uh, writing and analyzing and those kind of things and put it together and create really cool instruction. And, uh, you know, the, a professor, I remember when he brought uh, Mosaic, you know, and Gopher, and we thought those were the coolest things in the world. Like Mosaic, wow, it's, it's so much better than Gopher because it's graphical. Now, at the time, the internet took an hour and a half to download a graphic, but nevertheless, you could see a graph. And so that really kind of got me, me started. And so then I, I um, said, I want to get a degree in this field because this is really, really fascinating to me. And I just I just got hooked on it. 
I could absolutely see it. But now is your mind is completely blown by seeing the evolution of everything from 1998 to now. <laughs> like, it's crazy. I mean, it ha- it, it's so di- like when I went and structural technology, people were going industrial design. I'm like, no, where did you even get that right now? It's, Oh, you teach. No, I don't teach, but I, you know, my mother-in-law still has no idea what I do. So oh, the idea of, right. What, what is instructional technology was, wasn't there. Now the interesting thing though, back then we were studying virtual reality and we're still studying virtual reality. <laughs> so the more things change, the more they stay the same. So some of the things are really fascinating how they've changed and some things are really interesting why they haven't changed. So it's been a really interesting ride and I've, I've enjoyed every, every moment of it. I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure. And speaking of changing, obviously things in our world have changed <laughs> by far. Yes. The, the, <laughs> yeah. the pandemic has made things very different for us over here in um, an ID land. And for us who are already in the field, I think we've all adapted. We figured out what to do and where to go next. But for those who are there, just been introduced to instructional design, there's many teachers out there that just realize this is a field or they've heard about it, but they never really thought about it. And now people are seriously considering, hey, maybe I should become an instructional designer. And that is certainly where uh, the confusion goes into everything is that as just normal people who have gone back to school, I think that's the first idea that people have is, oh, I should go back to school and get bachelor's, master's, PhD, you know, whatever it is. But then there's always these other different options of you have different forms of certificates, or you could potentially train yourself for various, you know, so many different things out there nowadays. So before you do anything else, how do you actually know if it's right for you to go back to school? Yeah, that's a great question. So yeah, it always fascinated me how teachers didn't know about instructional design and how college professors didn't know about instructional design. But to me, I think one of the things that you want to think about is, is, you know, kind of look at where you are in your, now, obviously I'm going to have a bias toward going back and getting your degree, but uh, take a look at where you are in your career and where do you want to go? What do you want to do with it? So if you're a teacher and you're just tired of teaching and you kind of want to do some development of instruction, but it's just something that you're doing because, you know, it's um, not your advocation, it's just your vocation then I think there are a lot of methodologies to get up to speed, to understand what to do. Teachers make great instructional designers. But if you're thinking about really changing careers or taking a deep dive or looking extensively at the field, then I think a degree makes sense. If you really are interested in immersing yourself in the concepts and ideas, uh, I, I think if you do it for a little bit of a, like certainly, it makes sense if you're like, hey, I got a few years to retirement or, you know, I think this might be of, of interest, then take some uh, non-degreed approaches. If you're like, you know, I really want to explore this and understand it and and take a deep dive, then I think degrees work really well, master's degrees and, and then PhDs. Uh, PhDs are, are funny. You can price yourself out of a market if you go for a PhD. Uh if you want to teach, you should definitely get a PhD. Um, but sometimes uh, you're overqualified if you if you have a PhD. So be careful about why you want to get that. I, I say to people, if you want to consult, PhD is perfect because it, de- it definitely adds a sense of um, consult on the strategic level. Definitely adds a sense of credibility and things like that. If you want to be a freelancer and you want to get into storyline or whatever, there's so many ways you can learn those tools. And many graduate programs don't even have those tools. So if you approach it from the tool perspective, many graduate programs are not the way to go. Um, If you want – and the other problem I've heard about in instructional technology programs is that uh, the designers that come out are too rigid. Like they won't adapt to the model. And I always say my students, you know, take the A and Addy and the E and Addy and just chop them off and you have die. And so most <laughs> companies just want to die their instruction, right? So that's the way you approach it. So that, uh, uh, you know, you need to think about that. Now, on the other hand, you can make your whole living just doing learning analysis, or you can make a whole living just doing evaluation. So it depends on like kind of where you want to approach it from. But I think there are there are valid reasons to do both. Um, uh, and I, 
<laughs> I mostly counsel people. They say, I'm thinking about getting a PhD or I'm thinking about a master's degree. I'm like, go for it, do it because you never regret doing it. You always regret not doing it mm. uh, in my experience. Mm -hmm. So just go ahead and, and, and go for it and, and see what you can do and what kind of uh, examples. But, you know, going back to school full time is, or even part time is a commitment. Uh, and online, it's a commitment. And what kind of commitment do you want to make? And then how do you want to leverage your return on investment? Do you want it right away? Then getting the skills right away, being an instructional designer right away, uh, taking workshops right away is very effective. If you're kind of in the long haul, then getting the degree and investing that way can be uh, pretty lucrative as well. So let's say that you've made up your mind and you're determined you're going to go back to school, but you already have, let's say, like a bachelor's in education or a bachelor's in IT or, or something similar ish enough where you're now facing the crossroads of do I get a certificate or do I actually go and get the full degree? I, I've heard right. that a lot of times, too, because for the, the cert, you dive in deep to the heart of the core of like the four to six courses that you're like, these are what I'm really interested in. But obviously, the degree has much more to offer, but it's going to, of course, take more time. So what kind of value could you get from like one over the other? Or does this go into more of like a question about sector? You, you mentioned about freelance higher ed, but like for corporate, is a certificate enough if you already have a degree and this is just the icing on the cake? Or is it, you know, something? else entirely so that's a great question so i i think certificates a couple things one certificates work really well if you're in a position of already designing instruction but you don't quite have any kind of formal background and you want to solidify that or if you're like a professional trainer and you want to go into designing instruction or you're in marketing and you really like designing instruction better certificate works really well because you already have a job you're that if you are fresh out of school and and you're or you're in a field and you're trying to uh that's totally not related and you're trying to compete with other people who have degrees uh then it becomes a, the the certificate doesn't you know if two people are being evaluated their certificate versus the masters the masters will win out because if you don't have that experience if you don't have um examples to show. If you don't have a portfolio, you can run into problems. So it's really important, I think, to examine where you are in your career trajectory um, and then figure out where you want. If you got years of experience and you have some knowledge and you're not totally shifting careers, I think a certificate works really well. If you're totally shifting from logistics, let's say, to uh, designing instruction, uh, or from, uh, you know, you, you've taught K, you know, you've taught kindergarten and now you want to teach adults. Um, while many of the similarities, uh, the degree is going to help you with any stigma of a hiring person going, eh, I, I don't know, you, you know, you, you don't, uh, you've taught kids, but you don't have that instructional technology background, you know, so the certificate can be helpful, um, in that, element, but the master's will be better to win the job. Now, neither the certificate nor the master's ultimately get you the position. It's kind of what you're able to do, what, what your um, portfolio looks like, uh, lots of other intangibles. So um, relying on one solely to get you a job is not a good plan. You know, you've got to think beyond that and you've got to think about, well, what, 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 what can I show? What can I do? What can I leverage that I already know and bring to the to the table? That's awesome. And I'm so glad that you said portfolios, too, because that has definitely been one of like the hot topics when it comes to looking at a degree is just overall, whenever someone is just like, oh, I think I want to go back to school. And we're looking at the overall curriculum of what the program has to offer. And we're starting to go through courses like together, like we, we read the course descriptions together. And I'm looking at it. And I was just like, you know, I think this is it's a good start. But I was like, but I feel like it's kind of missing something. And a portfolio is one of those things that somehow doesn't come across in the curriculum is that you can end up finishing but still not have a portfolio at the end of the day, which is kind of um, interesting for our our industry. So I, I, it's, yeah, it's uh, just, no interesting. It's um, uh, it's not fraudulent, but it's borderline, right? So right. If you, right. if you if you are so I saw a debate the other day on Facebook or someone said you know, some programs just teach the theory and they teach it da, 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 and others only teach, you know, the tools and, you know, da, da, da. and I'm like, uh, why can't we teach both? Like our program at Bloomsburg, we teach the theory and the tools. 
So when you graduate, you've used Beyond, you've used Storyline, you've used Captivate, you've done a uh, podcast and Audacity, you've you know you've done that stuff, but you're also learning the theory of the design of the instruction. And so programs should really do both. And are, it's really important that, um, and this is kind of a, a question that we talked about before, but it's really important that you look for a program that has both. Unless the, the, if you want to go on to become a professor, then go on a pure academic focused, here's the theory, here's a deep dive into the theory, here's, you know, every person that, you know, Genye and, you know, Merrill and all those kind of stuff. Um, but um, if you want to get a job in corporate uh, and you talk to a client about Genye, they're going to look at you like you've got three heads, right? Who's this gagany person, right? So that's not going to help. That's not going to help you get ahead. Like corporate people know about it, but their clients, their stakeholders, their business leaders don't care. All they care is that you've gained the attention, that you've recalled prior knowledge, and that that person can do the job when they're done. And that's really what the focus is in corporate. You know, academic is a little different. If you become an academic instructional designer, you. <laughs> I can say this because I'm a faculty member and you work with faculty. Are you faculty or you work with faculty? I oh. am. An, so I'm an adjunct instructor for one university and then I am a program manager for MIT. Ah, so you're so, both sides. Both sides. I am both sides of the coin. <laughs> so you know, sometimes working with faculty is an experience all in and of itself. Um, yeah. Some yeah. faculties are like my son when he was younger. Somehow they were blessed by knowing everything. Even even things that they've never heard about, right? Like instructional design. So um, the idea there is that you've got to work with them a little bit differently than you would work with a corporate environment, which is differently than you would work with kids and parents. You don't, you know, when you go uh, as a teacher going into instructional design, uh, one less stress is dealing with parents because parents, you know, somehow know, even though they're not trained, what's the best for their kids and everything. But um you have a different set of pressures and a different set of expectations and you've got to move a lot faster than you move in the classroom. You don't have as much autonomy as you do that you have in the classroom. You are sometimes asked to do things like, well, this won't work. Like we're just making them aware of this um, compliance issue. We're not actually changing behavior. Yeah. That's not what the client asked for. And, you know, sometimes if you don't do it, somebody else will. So, there's a lot of trade-offs that have to be considered uh, when you go from the academic environment or the K through 12 environment to a more of a corporate type of environment. The language is different. The expectations are different. Uh, when I got into academia, we have a corporate advisory council. And one of the people in the council said, you don't talk like an academician. You talk more like a corporate person. I'm like, well, that's because I came out of corporate. So um, even like just small things in your language uh, makes a big difference as you transition from the classroom to a corporate setting. So if I'm looking at a degree right now and I'm trying to review it, and let's say like I have a checklist in my head of what I know should be in there somewhere. One of the things that you mentioned is almost like it doesn't jump out when I review things where for me, I am always looking for relationship management, for negotiation, for talking to clients and SMEs and things of that nature. I'm, I'm looking for a course that somehow words that somewhere in there <laughs> that you're going to get this experience of basically just collaborating and, and working with others. Are there any types of warning signs, I guess I'm asking about, is that if you're reviewing a program, it doesn't have something, does that instantly shoot off a red flag, whether it's portfolio or certain models or they, they do too much or? Right. So, so one of my, one of my big warnings is, and, and one of my pet peeves, because this was in graduate school, is if they don't teach you any tools and the excuse typically is. There's so many tools out there. They ch change so frequently. You shouldn't you learn any tool. And I'm like, okay, so now you get this degree and you don't have any tool to use it. That's not good. Um, so look for courses that have tools. The second is also look for design courses, like theory courses. So if it's only tools or only theory, don't do that. The other thing is look for courses where you have to work on a team. I'm sorry, if you're going to get into this field, you've got to work on a team. If you are 
uh, someone that doesn't like people, this is not the field for you. It's okay not to like people, I guess, but don't like them in this field because it's not going to work, right? You can't sit in the corner. So look for courses where they force you to do group work. Oh, I hate group work. Somebody always, you know, da, da, da. Guess what? That happens in real life, right? If you think when you get out of the classroom that you're going to be at a team and everybody's going to carry their weight, sorry, not happening, right? There's always somebody that doesn't carry their weight for whatever reason. So look for um, courses that have team in them. Look for courses that uh, um, or coursework or a program that has um, portfolio development in it. It doesn't have to be a course, but that you have experience with software that you can put into a portfolio. portfolio. The other thing that I always say is look for their relationship. If you want to go corporate or academic, look for their relationship with those kinds of organizations. So does the school have any kind of relationship with corporations? Does the school have, uh, for example, some schools have commercial arms where they do work with graduate students or undergraduate students on real life projects. So look for that. Um, that is something that you definitely want to see. Look for um, schools where their faculty are active in the field that you want to be in. So uh, there's some schools that have a very heavy uh, K-12 or a very heavy college focus. There's other schools that have a corporate focus. So if you want, for example, corporate, look for faculty members that are speaking at corporate industry events. If you want academic, look for academic people that are speaking at academic industry events. Because if the faculty aren't engaged with the field, then it's going to be really hard for you to get that leg up as you want to get involved in the field. So make sure you do that. The other thing to look for, this is a little bit trickier, but look for um, programs where you do a project for an outside client. So for example, uh, it, to learn ID, you might want to learn how to do ID for a Boy Scout troop or learn uh, uh, for a library or for the local police station or for a local company or something like that. So look for, comp look for programs that have those kind of requirements for the course where you actually have to have a finished product when you're done. Um, those can really make a difference. Look for programs where they're supported by the other parts of the university. So for example, does the administration support them? And, and then, you know, the program at Bloomsburg has been around since 1985. I didn't start it in 1985, uh, my predecessor did. But um, it's got a long history. So look for program, you know, now that the pandemic has hit a few years ago, everybody popped up, hung up a shingle, said, hey, academic instructional technology program. Well, where did they come from? Where, what's their history? What are they doing? So you want to look into that, too. That's if you want to go for a degree. I mean, if you want to go for like a certificate or, or, or um, a series of workshops Look for somebody that has a lot of experience delivering the kind of instruction, who's done the job so that they can give you their advice and kind of help you through that process. So there's a lot of different ways to think about it. But those kind of things I look for in a program, I look for a faculty member that's actively involved. I look for real world experiences. I look for um, portfolio work. I look for group work. I look for support from the rest of the university. If you look at those elements, um, that you, you're going to pick a pretty good program. Yeah, that's wonderful. And the one thing I would add on top of all of that too, which is not a part of the program. So it's kind of an interesting addition, but it still reminded me as soon as you were talking more about it is to be able to chat with the alumni to yeah. see where they are. What have they done? Where are they currently working? What are their skill sets? Because when you can talk to them, and that's something I wish I did, you know, way back in, in 2006, when I started to think more about going to college and this is would be to network and talk with people. <laughs> what, yeah. what have you done? Where are you going? What's going on? And that that connection networking piece is huge. That's a great, that's such a great advice. Yeah, absolutely. Talk to and look to see if alumni are um, active with the program. For example, at, at Bloomsburg, twice a year, we have our Corporate Advisory Council, and we invite uh, alumni back. So we get 30 to 40 alumni every semester who evaluate the upcoming students. It's almost like a rite of passage, right? Cool. It's, I call it – it's, it's, it's basically your defense. And so um, you have to write a proposal. I, I would say the other thing is, is 
look for um, programs where they don't just teach you design, but the business of the business, right? So, because you want to know about it. So um, in this, this capstone class, and I didn't invent this, uh, Dr. Bailey did, Hank Bailey, who founded the program. But basically, he had students write a, a proposal based on a mock RFP, develop a sales presentation, a working prototype, and a response. And then you present it to this corporate advisory council, who then evaluates you on how well you wrote the document, created the um, prototype, and gave the sales presentation. So now you're getting sales skills as well as design skills, as well as business skills. You have to price out a project. So look for programs like that so that you can uh, be successful when you graduate. I can't tell you how much public speaking I do nowadays, by the way, as an instructional designer who normally you would think, oh, you're just sitting behind your computer. It's just like, I am constantly presenting. (laughs) Like, I wish I had known this before. Luckily, (laughs) I I like to speak. I have this microphone, you know, so this is, this is fun for me. But the amount of people I keep on telling them about this of just, Hey, FYI, get, get ready to demo more and present and, you know, go up and whether it's going to be presenting at a conference, talking about a white paper or trying to convince somebody that, Hey, this program's right for you. It's a, a known thing, and I just feel like this is going to grow more and more now since we have these different forms of opportunities and ways to connect via Zoom and right. <laughs> everything else that we're doing, right? So it's definitely interesting. And to your point for everything you just said, too, obviously, from I, I've not taken any courses at uh, Bloomsburg, but just knowing the fact that you invite back your students to come and talk means that obviously they have done well. Cause you're not going to invite back people who are like, yeah, that, it didn't really work out for me. I'm still just not, I didn't find a job yet. Yeah, you know, yeah. so that, that speaks about my dad's yeah. garage, but yeah, yeah, exactly. I'd love to talk about instructional design. Yeah. No, right, yeah. 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 <laughs> that, so that, that speaks volume about everything. So let's say hypothetically, we have somebody who is in a another university, a different degree program, and they are realizing halfway through, Hey, this isn't what I thought it was. But I'm already halfway through, so I'm going right. to finish. Because yeah. unfortunately, there have been plenty of people, as you were talking about, just don't rely so much on only one skill set of the learning theories or the tools. And, and that's what I've definitely heard from a lot of folks, especially in higher ed. Hey, I just learned about 10 different learning theories, but I have no practical experience. I'm like, well, that's not good. <laughs> that's not going <laughs> to help. Right, that's yeah. not really going to help you. So yeah. for those folks who are finding themselves in these kind of sticky uh, situations, what could they do as far as for trying? to upskill currently at the same time while going to school. Right. So the salesperson in me says transfer to Bloomsburg. That's the first thing. <laughs> sure. Let's say that they can't do that or or, or it's not pr- practical. Um, but we do accept all kinds of degrees. But anyway, so uh, the fortunately nowadays there are a number of ways to do it. So we talked about LinkedIn Learning has great skill set. Um, if you look at Articulate's online community, If you're a self-starter and you jump into that community, you can learn a lot. Uh, You could look at, you know, some of the things, Luke, even that you're doing in terms of uh, getting more practical skills and using that to augment um, the skill set and what people are doing, uh, you know, if if they want to supplement the degree. And the other thing would be to find uh, nonprofits that need instruction and develop it, right? So, um, Learn the tool, apply the tool, develop the tool. There are lots of online communities. There are lots of groups that you can join. Um, And sadly, um, when you see advertisements for instructional designers, they want everything plus the kitchen sink, right? They want you to design. They want you to develop. They want you to know every tool, even tools that are obscure and, you know, all kinds of things. The good news is you can Google almost any tool and watch a, at least an introductory tutorial. So um, spend the time doing that, building your tor- uh, building your pro- portfolio, learning those tools, applying those tools, and then that's how you get into into the position. And again, just because you have a degree, just because you have a portfolio, doesn't automatically mean you're going to get a job. You're going to have to apply yourself. And you know, the good news is uh, everybody has heard about the field of instructional design, and it's a great field for teachers. The bad news is everybody's heard about it and it's a great, you know, and everybody's going into it. So um, you, you, it's going to be a little bit competitive. The other thing I would think of is like my wife's a microbiologist and she actually got a, a, a job at a company doing life science instructional design. She actually went through our program a number of years ago 
And she combines her background of epidemiology with instructional design. So take your background, whatever it happens to be, and see if you can't work instructional design into it. So could you do the design for kids? Could you put stuff stuff on on teachers helping teachers, right, and sell something? So now you have something on your portfolio that you could say, hey, not only did I create this and people are using it and finding value, but guess what? I made a little bit of money, so I understand the entrepreneur process. Or, hey, I was in um, you know, uh, K through 12 and I was teaching French and I made this kind of French flashcard game using Articulate. Hey, guess what? Boom, I got this. Hey, I was doing this and I used Captivate. So take your background and apply it to what you're doing. That's going to help you tremendously. So, so to sum it up is grab something like LinkedIn Learning or other um, tool-based instruction, get that. Find places for practical application of instructional design, use that. And then join groups like on Facebook and LinkedIn and other places that are communities helping instructional designers figure out the field. Um, it's a great thing to have all this uh, new perspective and ideas in the field, but it makes for like the fog of uh, increased learning, right? The fog of increased opportunity. And so um, having someone to guide you through that can be pretty helpful. Absolutely. And I love the idea too of just trying to go and use something like a LinkedIn learning or something else along those lines to even just hear a different perspective, have someone teach it to you a different way, even if you already know what it is. Right. And that's yep. that's how I found you. And I can't recall if it was something for gamification or for ad ears. It was a while ago, but I remember being like, ah, I'm kind of curious. What's, what's his perspective on that? Because all my professors in my doctoral program, they all could teach you know the same similar subjects, but they all had their own angle. So it was like, oh, okay, I relate to this one more. Let me see how I can use that to my advantage. And it was this, it was neat. So what if, let's say, you have the opposite problem. You have like a thousand electives you can choose from that are all awesome, <laughs> right. which I, I know for some of these programs, they're, they're huge. Uh, yeah. I'm, it's just astonishing of how much is actually out there. So if you're able to, let's say, pick a couple of electives, but you're able to choose between learning analytics, scenario-based learning, gamification, blended learning, you know, is there a, a certain way of going about picking and choosing how to stack? the right ones or for thinking about what you want to do next? Like, how do you go about that? Right. So I, I have two uh, thoughts on electives. So one is you could use electives to get a good breadth of the field. So if you're like, hey, I really kind of want to find out what's about. Let me take, you know, analytics over here and LMS over here and gamification over here and that kind of stuff and get a great perspective. That's helpful. Uh, but if you're really saying, OK, at the end of this big investment, I want it to pay off and I want a job. Then you need to stack your electives toward a subspecialty. So, for example, it might be learning management systems. And so, well, what do you learn? Well, learning management systems, there might be a course in that. There might be a course in analytics in learning management systems. There might be a course in uploading courses or thinking about curriculum. You know, then go that way. If you're interested in, hey, I want to create game based learning then maybe look for courses in gamification, branching scenarios, uh, designing instructional games, something like that. If you want to do analysis, look for courses on evaluation, assessments, conducting focus groups, writing good survey questions, you know, that kind of thing. So you should really sit down with your advisor or, or uh, and think about where do you want to specialize? And, and again, I, I'll go back to your background, right? So if, if you have a, let, let's say you were a history teacher and you did a lot of work analyzing history, maybe analysis would be a good place for you. If you were a math professor and you really got into the coding, maybe uh, developing is, so take authoring, advanced authoring, HTML, you know, those kind of things. So think about what you've done, where you want to go, what kind of position you want, and then stack your electives in that direction. If you've got the the luxury of just figuring out the field because you know you're new or you're young or you're just curious, then take a smattering of electives. But most people don't have that um, luxury, so I would say figure out where you've been, where you want to go, and then put the electives together to get you to your end spot. 
I wish you were my, my advisor back in the day in college. <laughs> FYI, FYI. <laughs> As I, my, my bachelor's is in graphic design and I faced this issue. I had 7,000 electives and I'm like, Oh, I don't know. Uh, let's what? see what, what sounds good. <laughs> <Right>. uh, <laughs> you know, when I I'm picking and choosing here and, and now if I, of course could go back in time, it's like, wow, I really wish that I went down like the UX UI type of road where yeah. before I picked one of web design, one of flash, Hey, flash is dead. You know, right. and if you, yeah, you're like, yeah, great. This is super awesome. So, uh, no, it's awesome. I absolutely love that different answer too, because it, it certainly it makes sense where you have the breadth, you have the depth, you can pick and choose what exactly you want to do. Because for some job postings too, they specifically call out certain skill sets over others. Um, yeah, we, we saw a job posting the other day that was requiring an instructional designer to know about UDL. And they called it out right there. And I was like, that's awesome. <laughs> like, right, that, yep. that's the place you want to work for. And you could, you know, yeah, try to get and tailor everything you want to do yep. towards a job toward that. organization like that. Right. Like yep. that just is this 100% makes a ton of sense. So I want to ask a professor in this field, how do you stay on top of the current trends and issues within everything for instructional <laughs> design? Because yeah. it's nuts. And I know that as academics, sometimes we don't move the speed in which we want to because there are barriers and we try to get around those. So uh, how do you do it? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, a couple of things. One, so from a pure academic perspective, for example, I, I haven't published a ton of peer reviewed articles because they take so long. So I would say uh, to remain active in the field, what I do is I try to write practitioner guides and by researching what practitioners are doing and consulting. I, uh, I think one really good way, and again, I said this before, but look for faculty members in the program that are in the field, consulting, speaking, writing, because they have to stay on the edge because people will hire them. And um, the big secret about consulting is we learn as much consulting as we do giving to the client because we find out, oh, what are the issues? What tools are they working with? What kind of items are they working with? So, so I stay fresh by consulting. I stay fresh by writing about the latest trends in the field. And I stay fresh with my students. I had a student, I tell the story over and over again, but way back when student Waleed came into my office and said, Dr. Cobb, Dr. Cobb, you, this thing called blogging, it's so cool. You should be blogging. And I'm like, what is blogging Waleed? And he explained it to me. And I said, he goes, yeah, you write every day and you know, people read your stuff. And I'm like, Waleed, that's all I need is one more thing to do every day. You gotta be kidding me. And then like two years later, I'm like, oh my God, blogging, I should be blogging. You know, Waleed gave me a two year head start that I totally squandered. So, um, the students always seem to have, uh, a handle on like what's a really cool thing that's happening or really interesting thing or they're like oh check out what's up dr cop what's up what's that you know i thought that was a beer commercial right now it's whatsapp you know you, you check that out hey check out this new uh 3d software that i found oh cool you know so uh, students also help keep me up to date and i think it's really important to um to listen to the students i think a lot of um, not a lot, but some faculty members who have made it to uh, being a faculty member, they're tenured, et cetera. They've been teaching it the same way. They're pretty comfortable doing that. And they're very uncomfortable not knowing something. But in this field, you can't, you, you should, you should always not know something, right? Because it's impossible to know everything. So to be open to the new ideas that the students have and the new ideas that are happening in the field. And then the other thing that I do is I go to the conferences and I'll walk the booths and I'll just say to the, Hey, show me something cool or show me what you're looking at or show me what's really interesting. And that's important because, you know, a lot of people poo poo vendors, but vendors are like consult. They talk to a lot of different customers and find out what their needs are. And then they have a solution for that. So they know what's going on. They are, have a lot of insight. And so talking to them can be very helpful as well. So those are some ways that I try, try to keep up. up. And then um, uh, one of the futurists said, um, the way to predict the future is to make the future. So mm -hmm. if you can find some area that you think is interesting and you can push the envelope a little bit, I was fortunate with gamification um, and, and literally – you know, for years, I've, I had fellow faculty members. I had people tell me, 
we're not making games here. Why, why are you talking about this thing? Or gamification doesn't make any sense. I had a huge online battle with someone about the manipulative nature of gamification. I mean, all kinds of things. And I just kind of thought it was interesting. So I just kind of persevered and turns out that, you know, became a thing. I didn't plan for it to become a thing, but I was really interested in it. So um, if as a faculty member or someone in the field, find an area of interest and, and just absorb the information there. Like, so for example, and look outside the field. So, so for example, uh, you know, contact lenses that have images on them, like microchips that present images are going to be an awesome tool for augmented reality. And so I kind of keep an eye on what's happening. And guess what's going to happen? Deep fake videos are going to be used to create characters in our training. We're not going to need to do videos anymore with the cast of characters. We'll make fake characters. And in five years, you'll type in new clothes and they'll look as up to date as the date. I mean, all those kind of things that are not here yet. And maybe it'll be 10 years before they're mainstream, but you should look at them and you should think about them and you should uh, think, well, what would happen if my instruction was delivered on a microchip in somebody's left eye? Like, what would that look like? You know, so sometimes those thought exercises can be helpful as well. So those are a, a number of different ways that I try to think about the future. And there's tons of stuff that, you know, like I miss um, just because, I, I mean, you can't keep up with everything. But I think it was William Gibson who said the future's already here. It's just not very evenly distributed. And I think that's how we need to think about it. You know, you can look at pockets of people doing stuff and think, oh, yeah, that's going to be the future. OK, I should keep an eye on that. And someone, another wise person said to me, you know, when the Internet first started and you couldn't do vi I mean, you couldn't do video on it. I mean, we went backwards. We went from CD-ROMs, which were media rich, branching, et cetera. And then when the Internet hit, we went backwards. Right. You couldn't put images on the Internet until like after a while. And then video on the Internet was like pulling out your hair, as you can tell, you know, like it just didn't work. Right. So um, someone said to me, though, he goes, even though videos on the Internet now are poor, you should learn all about it because in 10 years or so, it will be ubiquitous and you'll have a 10 year start on everyone else. So if, if people say, yeah, I don't know about this AR, VR, whatever, or I don't know about whatever deep fakes or uh, be aware of that because uh, things have a way of going from the fringe to mainstream. Like, and the greatest example of this, I always think is um, Janis Joplin has a song. Oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? Oh Lord. You know, that was a protest song about capitalism. And she was, when she came first was very fringy. And then be, and the a uh, couple of years ago, there was a commercial on TV for a Mercedes Benz using that song. Uh, Janice is obviously rolling over here in our grave, but it just shows that the evolution of fringe to middle happens all the time. And it happens in our field, I think, even more than other fields. So we have to look at the fringe and then be aware of what's happening. It's just absolutely mind blowing because sometimes too, what you're saying on the fringe is that it's just one small little tweak and then all of a sudden it explodes. Yeah. I mean, I think about Clubhouse uh, and podcasting recently. Nothing too crazy. That's that difference, but just enough where everyone's like, oh my gosh. And same thing when I think about live streaming and video games, just the yeah. explosion of how much that happened. And now what I'm currently seeing, because I'm, I'm huge into football and to a couple of different sports and seeing YouTube live with how some different people host different sports events that aren't the the big time ESPN NFL networks, but they're just just a smaller type of people. But then they can have thousands of people watch at the same time just by using YouTube TV and like FaceTime. And then that's it. <laughs> that's all yeah, they're it's doing. Crazy. It's, you know, yeah. and it's just like that's that's the only technology they have. And then thousands of people are tuning in. So it's it's just absolutely mind blowing. I am afraid I'm going to completely miss out on the VR experience, by the way. I get motion sickness like crazy <laughs> and I've, I've tried a couple of different headsets. So like the Oculus and the PlayStation ones. And of course I'm like, Oh, I can't wait. And then three seconds later, I'm like sitting down on the ground. Cause I need stabilization where I'm like, no, the world is spinning. I can't do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I really think AR is going to leapfrog VR. Sure. Yeah. It, it, it's not uh, VR is um, it's too isolating, I think, which yeah. is ironic. Cause it, I mean, it, yeah. Anyway, so um, yeah, I really think AR is uh, gonna gonna leap 
leapfrog that, but I get sick too. Like, I, like, okay, you're just not quite there yet. That's why I kind of laugh, right? Over 20 years ago or 30 years ago when I'm in graduate school and there was a Wall Street Journal article had Jean Larnier, you know, with his dreadlocks and his big helmet. He was all VR is the future. And here we are in, you know, 2021 and it's not quite the future just yet. So it's some things take a lot longer to unfold. Yeah, I know. But then once they do, then that's it. And then they, they boom. Then everyone gets it. <laughs> and then the other interesting thing, so so the whole thing with Clubhouse is that, um, and, and this is a really interesting point, is that we always are looking toward the next technology, but sometimes taking a step back and disaggregating some of the technology and simplifying it makes all the difference. Yeah. So uh, I'm involved right now in, in uh, you know, I, I've been doing games, you know, forever. And what I found is that, uh, digitizing something like a card game is almost more powerful than an online learning game like World of Warcraft or something like that because everybody knows how to play cards. Everybody expects, oh, you flip a card. Oh, you sort a card. Oh, you shuffle cards. And so there's no learning in how the game works. It's all on the content. And things like that, uh, I think, are you know very helpful from the perspective of the field. It's amazing when you think back and see something and you're like, wow, it was right there. What happened to it? I think about MySpace. MySpace, I have a customized HTML amazing page. I can put up my own banner, my own music. I can select top people. I can customize my wall. And then we go to Facebook, which is like, no, this is what you're going to do. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> you're like, wait, wait, what happened? Yeah. <laughs> I had all these options and now they're gone. And yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's it, it's a good time. Well, Carl, I'm just going to ask you one more question and then let you head on out of here. But I am just absolutely you know, really curious now to ask because you already shared some awesome stories about things. Just curious, what is your favorite story when it comes to an instructional design student landing their dream job because of what they went through at Bloomsburg? Yeah, so uh, so this is interesting. So back in 2000, so I'm teaching in like 97 98, 99, you couldn't, students were being snapped up before they graduated, right? Because the 2000 boom, right? So our students were, they weren't even web developers, but they were kind of aligned with web development. And so people were like signing bonuses and all kinds of stuff. And then uh, literally one semester, like 80 people at the Corporate Advisory Council, students getting signing bonuses, the crash, the next semester, the students were like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? Like, how am I going to find a job? And the greatest thing are our alums and students. We had more people at that corporate advisory council event than any of the ones leading up to it. And they supported those students and they helped them any way they could get internships and and, and get even uh, pro bono work so that they could get the skills and you have to have your internship to finish your degree so that they could all at least finish their degree while the world like kind of bottomed out. And to me, that was really uh, a testament to the students and the alumni, how when even at the worst, of, at the best of times they showed up, but also the very next semester at the worst of times they showed up and supported the current crop of students. And I always say, pay it forward. And those folks paid it forward. And to me, that was one of the most exciting and thrilling times of my teaching career to know those people came back and supported those students when they knew the students had not, I mean, literally job one semester, no jobs the next semester, but as many, if not more people supporting them. So that that's my favorite story of uh, instructional design. I love it. Let's end on that positive, awesome, happy right. note. Carl, where can people go to learn more about you, your work, and everything else? So uh, uh, so the easiest way is probably to Google me. Uh, it's uh, Carl, K-A-R-L-K-A-P-P. -P, but I have a website, carlcop.com. I'm, I'm on Twitter at K-K-Cop, um, K-K-A-P-P. -P. Uh, on Twitter, I am uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn Learning. Uh, I'm on YouTube. I have a YouTube channel. I just, uh, as I said, released the unauthorized, unofficial history of learning games, which has been a fun video series. So I'm there. Um, I've got books. Uh, so if you go to Amazon and Google, so like kind of, kind of all over, I try to 
offer as many things as I can um, because I'm just interested in a lot of different things. And I know different people like to consume media different ways. So you can get a book, you can get uh, a, 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 a LinkedIn learning course, you can get a YouTube video, all, all kinds of places. And of course, at Bloomsburg University. Yeah, you know, probably there. It's probably probably not, there, yeah, yeah. Probably Love never to see people there. there. Right. You know, <laughs> you know, absolutely. Well, Carl, thank you so much for your time. It's been absolutely so awesome to dive on into this. Appreciate it. Well, Luke, thanks for having me. I really appreciate being on the show. Thank you so much. Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed that episode. I had an absolute blast chatting with Carl. Um, as you can probably tell, I, I had a really fun time with this episode. His joke about taking the A and D out of Addy leaves you a die was just so funny to me. Uh, just an absolute fun episode overall. So, Carl, if you're listening, once again, thank you so much for coming on this episode. For all of you folks at home, be sure to check out all of Carl's amazing resources in the show notes. He has so many. I was not lying at the start of this episode that I try to include all of them, his books, his YouTube channel, his LinkedIn learning courses, and many more are linked down below in the show notes. If you are thinking about pursuing an instructional design degree, check out the link to Bloomsburg as well. Quite a few of you have been asking me for recommendations on where to go back to school. You made up your mind, you've done your research, this is really what you want to do. And as you just heard from Carl, he is a wealth of knowledge. And if you want to learn more from him, I would certainly give Bloomsburg Bloomsburg a strong, hard look. So I included the link to their master's degree down below in the show notes too. If you enjoyed today's episode, share this podcast on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. Feel free to tag me, by the way, in the post and tell me what you learned from this episode. If you haven't already, connect with me on LinkedIn and subscribe to my YouTube channel. That's what I've been doing nowadays. A lot of YouTube, a lot of podcasting, but still, YouTube's kind of uh, slowly <laughs> taking over my world. If you are looking for a group of learning nerds, by the way, to talk all about instructional design, check out the link in our Facebook group, which is called Instructional Design Institute Community, and you can find that link in the show notes as well. As always, your five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts or your podcast player of choice are deeply appreciated. So thank you for all of you who have been uh, leaving reviews for the podcast. I saw that they've actually been going up recently, which is awesome. So once again, shout out to you. Thank you all so much. And folks, that, that's it. That's all I have for you today. Stay nerdy out there. And I'll talk to you next time. Yeah.